All right. Hello, everybody. Um, so today is a little bit special. We're trying something new. We're doing a hybrid version. Um, so we do have some people in person here and we're still setting up the projector and everything. Um, and then we have you guys here on Zoom, which is awesome on this rainy day we got. Didn't want to come outside. But to get us started, my name is Brianna Coma with Conservation Nebraska, and we are so excited to have everybody here um, to learn more about reptiles and especially Nebraska natives. That's going to be the, the most important part for you on Zoom. A couple of reminders before we get started. Um, your cameras are off and you are muted, so you cannot be seen or heard. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat box and we will get, get to them at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, there will be a quick little poll that pops up on your screen that we'll have you guys do um, here at the beginning. And then at the end, we'll also have you do another one. Um, so that should just have popped up on your screen. And then there will be another one at the end. This just helps us um, get a better understanding of um, how these webinars are helping you guys, if they're um, really helping the education and all that stuff and see what you guys are kind of interested in. Um, so yeah, so lastly, um, this is being recorded. So if you missed anything or wanted to share it with anybody, um, this will be posted on Conservation Nebraska's YouTube channel in a few weeks. Um, so we're still waiting for the projector to get going, but I'm gonna do a little intro on Dan and then we're gonna get started here. Um, Dan is a herpetologist and a um, life and science instructor at Southeast Community College. Um, he does research that is centered on distribution of Great Plains herpetofauna, as well as various factors that affect those distributions, such as habitat availability, alterations in land use, and global climate change. So with that being said, um, hopefully Dan is ready. And so in a few moments, we'll hand it over to Dan to get us started. So I'm going to end this poll, and um, we're going to hand it over to him. So you can see me on this, I don't like this, I'm just kidding. All right, so what I'm gonna do is uh, talk to you. I, I could talk for hours about this, but they only gave me a 45 minute to an hour window. So what I did was pick a few things that you may or may not know about reptiles in Nebraska, not amphibians. We're not gonna talk about amphibians today. So frogs, salamanders, get them out of your head. It's all snakes, lizards, and turtles, right? Okay, so we're gonna start off with some questions. Maybe. Oops, we're gonna do it this way. Mm -hmm. Here we go. All right. Any, any guesses? How many reptile species are there in Nebraska? 100. 100. <laughs> if only. <laughs> 35. So somewhere in between 35 and 100. 49. 49. And this is how they are distributed. 49 species, there are 30 species of snakes, there used to be 29, we have a new species of snake in the past 10 years, so we've upped it to 30. 10 species of lizards, nine turtle species. And we can't talk about all of them today, but we can talk about a few of them. We'll hit uh, quite a few of them. All right, another question, true or false, snakes, lizards, and turtles are cold-blooded. Do you know this is a trick question? As we say, that's a trick question. Right, yeah, no. The only thing in the world that's cold-blooded are murderers and ex-spouses. <laughs> they are considered ectotherms. So ectotherms are animals that count on an external resource to get their heat. So the sun or a warm rock or a warm rock and the sun or a warm rock and sun and a warm breeze. Whatever they need that's warm, they find it. And when it gets too hot, then they evaporate and cool off or they find another place to go. So their body temperature is completely at the... Uh, mercy of whatever the temperature is outside. Uh, endotherms, like you, generate our own, our own body heat. And there are some benefits to being an ectotherm. Anybody ever have a pet snake, pet lizard? I've had pet snakes for, well, let's see, well, 45 years of my life, a long time. And people ask, well, so what do you feed them? And I feed them mice, and how often do they eat? Once every month and a half or so. And what, isn't that cruelty? No. Whenever you feed these animals, they don't use any of that food energy 
to generate heat like you do. So you have to spend all day long trying to maintain 98.6 degrees. These guys, so most of their food energy goes to growth. It's the reason that they grow fast. It's the reason they don't have to eat very often. However, being an exotherm also has its disadvantages. When it's cold, it reduces the mobility of these guys. So it brings up an important point, winter. We all live on the plains. We know what winter's like on the plains, right? What do we do? We go inside, put the heat on, cover up, and don't go out again until April. <laughs> what do they do? Well, the animals of the Great Plains, and not just the reptiles, not just the, the, the ectotherms, but the endotherms as well, are pretty hardy and pretty, I don't want to use the word, they're pretty badass because they deal with the hottest of summers and the coldest of winters, and they still survive and they do well. So to get out of the cold, uh, they sort of hibernate. They get underground, snakes and lizards will go underground, they get down below the frost line, maybe 35, 40 degrees Fahrenheit as an average temperature. Aquatic turtles get underwater, they stay below the ice and they bury themselves in the mud or they just sit on top of the mud. Box turtles are able to dig burrows and get deep and then they sleep deep under the ground and, and sleep all winter long. Um, and birds just mostly fly south. Right? Birds? Did I, did I say birds? Yeah. You want to go back? Yeah. What's that? Is that just a whole bunch of water snakes? That yes. Fly just emerging from hibernation. So many. On the right day up in Manitoba, you can get to 10 to 12,000 snakes on the ground at one time. I don't, I can imagine that it stinks. What? You can imagine that it smells. Oh. <laughs> Snakes. They smell. What's funny, so since you brought this up, and we're talking about all these snakes, um, where this happens, the first thing that these snakes do when they start to warm up is they get ready to breed for the breeding season. And so the girls wear perfume and the guys are like, Ooh. the garter snakes <coughs> will compete for the right to breed with the girl. And they form this great big ball and the girl is like, nope, not you, not you. Okay, you. So about 25% of the males in this population will produce a scent that smells like the female to trick other males and pull them away from the female so that it reduces their competition. <laughs> How about that for fun? All right, so I said birds, right? Do you know birds are reptiles? This is an Audubon Society, right? This is an Audubon place. I looked over there for a reptile book and I saw birds, 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 birds animals, plants, birds, birds. Birds are reptiles. You may not like it, you may not agree with it, you might not want to accept it, but they are. Uh, recently, in the past 20 years or so, um, DNA research has shown that birds and reptiles are each other's closest relatives. There's a relative between the two that's missing, and they're the Cerishian dinosaurs, which are gone, sadly. Uh, but right now, the closest relatives to birds are crocodilians. So Birds and crocodiles are more closely related to each other than crocodiles are to turtles, snakes, lizards, and the creepy looking thing called a tuatara. A tuatara. It's a lizard-like animal that lives off the coast of New Zealand, only lives on a couple of islands in New Zealand. It's been, it hasn't changed in 250 million years. It looks just like it did 250 million years ago. In essence, it's a dinosaur. So crocodiles, alligators, alligators. yes. So what is it about these guys that makes them sister taxa? What are the things they have in common? Well, of all the reptiles, the crocodilians are the only ones that have a four-chambered heart. All the rest of them have a three-chambered heart, which means that their oxygen poor blood mixes with their oxygen rich blood, which isn't as efficient as it could be. And so you'll see that, and I'll show you later, that turtles and frogs and other um, amphibians and reptiles often will have an alternative form of, of oxygen exchange, gas exchange, to make up for that mixing of, of oxygen poor and oxygen rich blood. But not the crocodilians, they have heart just like ours, right? And it breaks just as easily, so be nice <laughs> to the crocodiles. They build nests, crocodilians build nests, birds build nests. Crocodilians stay with their nests after they lay their eggs. And after their babies hatch, they kind of look after them for, for a while. <laughs> You don't see that with any of the other reptiles. You see that with the crocodilians and you see that with the birds. So, do all reptiles lay eggs? Yes. No. no. <laughs> nope. 
Um, well, birds and crocodilians do, obviously. Now that we got birds established as reptiles, we can keep talking about them. Uh, all of the turtles do. There are no turtles that give live birth, and of course, no birds and crocodilians. But snakes and lizards, some give live birth, some lay eggs. And in some places, there's a species or two that does both, depending on whether they live at the top of the mountain or the bottom of the mountain. If they're top of the mountain, they give live birth, bottom of the mountain, they lay eggs. Crazy. In Nebraska, we have both egg laying snakes and lizards and live bearing snakes and lizards. What's the only live bearing lizard that lives in Nebraska? Hmm? It's a jeopardy. It is a jeopardy. It's a final This is one of those two thousand dollar jeopardy questions, right? So first of all, you got to know the lizards on Nebraska, right? And you probably know that there are skinks out there and there are pegs lizards out there and those fast little race winners. But on the Panhandle, you have this really cool, cute little lizard that we call horny toad. And it's a horned lizard. It's called the short horned lizard or the greater short horned lizard, and they are live bears. They're the only lizards in Nebraska that give birth to live babies. And they're cute and they're tiny and they kind of, they do exactly this. They climb on mom for a little while, kind of like squirt. But they're small. And they're the greater shorthorn lizard. Right? The smaller ones, there's one called mountain shorthorn lizard, which is it's a little bit smaller. Now, the ones farther south, the ones in Texas, they're enormous. The ones in the California coast, you know, from Arizona, et cetera, they all get big. Why do you think they get big and ours stay small? I don't even need to be here. You guys know all of this stuff. What's that? No, that's a baby sitting on the pennies. That's one of the, that's a newborn. Yeah. If they were full grown in that size, I believe the pet industry would want millions of them to sell because they like little things. You could have a, a house full of them and it would take up like one table space. Yeah. All right. Speaking of eggs, I have a few egg things to talk about. Let's talk about turtles. I said that crocodilians build nests and stay with their babies. Turtles dig a nest as well. They use their back feet. You may have seen this around here. Oh, snappy turtles. Okay. On the state, sadly, they choose the side of the road to do this, and they often lose their lives just trying to lay eggs. They get run over. But they dig a hole. You can see the eggs in the bottom right here. They drop the eggs in the hole. They cover the eggs with dirt, and then they go away. And that's it. The babies are on their own. Um, in Nebraska, in a lot of places at this latitude, uh, baby turtles will hatch over the winter. Like sometime now, December, they'll hatch. And then they'll stay underground inside what's left of their egg until spring rolls around. And then they come out in the spring. That's why you see all kinds of babies. You're like, how can there be baby turtles in April? Like, when, the heck, when did they, when, when did they lay in the ground? But that's an adaptation to, if you're, if you hatch in October, November, you immediately got to figure out how to hibernate. And so it's best to just stay where you are. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they say they absorb the yolk, but keep in mind it's winter time in their ectotherms, and so they really don't need their their metabolism drops to almost nothing at this point. So, what little energy that they are going to use just to stay alive, they'll get from the yolk. And in fact, if you see baby snappy turtles come crawling out of the ground in March or April, you pick them up, you'll see a little egg yolk ball kind of stuck right in the middle of their last on the bottom shell. Mm -hmm. Sure, problem. Yeah. <laughs> go dig up a couple of nests and see what's in there. All right, more about eggs. Oops, two times. Some of our female, some of our, our, our lizards in Nebraska, the females of these lizards will actually brood their eggs. They lay their eggs and they stay with them and they turn them. You know, like you got to turn chicken eggs and other kinds of fowl eggs. So they will do that. They'll keep turning them so that they don't get too moldy on one side. And if one of the eggs goes bad and becomes moldy, they eat it. They're like, I'm not gonna waste this. So they gobble it down and they take that energy. And they still stay with their eggs. Now, when those babies hatch, they're done. All they wanna do is make sure they hatch. After that, babies are on their own. Not the best mamas in the world. 
not like crocodilians. So all of Nebraska is skinks, and we have four species of skinks, and they're all shown up here, the northern prairie skink, the great plains skink, the five land skink, many land skink, are all egg brooders. Around here, you probably have the northern prairie skink. I wouldn't be surprised if you had them in somewhere in the in the Heron Haven area. You haven't seen any? Put out some boards. Yeah? Huh. Uh, Hitchcock will have the Northern Prairie Skank and the Great Plains Skank. Great Plains Skank is a little harder to find than Hitchcock, but they're there. And they're big. They're like enormous. I don't recommend picking one up. It will not let go. You can walk around with it on your finger for the rest of the day until your skin finally falls off. And then you let it go. <laughs> They're, they're not the nicest. They're like um, collared lizards do the same thing down in Kansas. Collared lizards are like little dinosaurs. They will bite your fingers right off. I know. And even more about eggs. Snakes eat eggs. Some do. Not all of them. Some do. Um, there was a study done in the 1930s out at Crescent Lake, which is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge, or it might be a hunting area, I'm not sure what it is. But the keepers of that refuge were collecting bull snakes because they determined that bull snakes were responsible for, for eating more than two or 3,000 duck eggs per year. And, I'm, and the duck, duck hunters, of course, were like, we can't have that. But anyway, uh, around here you have, is that me? Around here you have uh, uh, Western rat snakes, what used to be called a black rat snake. And you'll see them up in trees and we'll talk about trees in a minute here, but they eat eggs. Mm -hmm. If you raise chickens or any kind of fowl, they're gonna be your biggest nemesis. And it's not just these guys, all the way down in Florida, Texas, the rat snakes are just big egg eaters. More so than the egg eating snakes. Hognose snakes are known for eating reptile eggs, specifically turtle eggs. Like they will get under the ground, find a turtle nest and then just eat their eggs. Sad. So what else do snakes eat? Well, for the most part, they eat rodents, at least here in Nebraska. They're carnivores. So look at what they have to do. They don't have any limbs, no arms, no legs. They have to find prey. They have to chase it down. They have to catch it. They have to kill it. Then they have to swallow it without arms and legs. I dare you to go home and try this, <laughs> right? Practice with like a tennis ball. Lay on the ground, put your hands on the side, and have somebody roll you a tennis ball and uh, 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 try to catch it with your mouth. <laughs> You'll fail. And it's not even alive. Try doing that with an animal that's alive. So most of the Nebraska's snakes are mammal eaters. But if you can't catch a mammal, what else is there? If you think catching mammals is difficult, be one of those black rat snakes. So not all Nebraska snakes eat mammals, and some of them never eat mammals, and not all eat mammals all the time. They're kind of opportunistic feeders, but there are a couple that continuously eat birds. And your black rat snake, the western rat snake, is one of these species. Um, when I go out to where I study rattlesnakes, I'll hear noises like a blue jay going crazy in the trees. And sometimes in the city, it's a hawk, but down there, it's usually a black rat snake. And I watched one one time go from one nest to another nest to another nest, eat the eggs, eat the chicks, you know, and eat the mamas. Well, you don't want to leave the chicks there by themselves with my mama. So they're being nice, they're being humane by taking the chicks out of there. Try doing that without any arms, right? <laughs> um, how is it then that a snake can eat birds and eat eggs? How do they get up in the tree? They have no arms and legs. Have you ever seen a snake climb? Yes, they climb pretty well. So look at the one on the bricks. That blew me away. I'm like, what? There's like hardly any space to hang on to. These guys are the best climbers in the world. They get the award, the best climbing snake ever. They can climb straight up a tree. They have a weird shaped body so that the bottom of their body is flat instead of rounded like other snakes. And so they use that to kind of wedge themselves in between pieces of bark. 
Some trees are better for them. Uh, hackberries, really good trees for them to climb because you get those big gaps between the bark. But it doesn't matter. They can climb up all of them. In Florida, they climb up palm trees. They okay. shimmy. Uh, and then they can climb up walls. They can get into people's houses. I've seen people get them. They're up on the top of their garage doors. When their garage doors close, then it comes down the snake. But they're not the only ones. A lot of snakes can climb. The larger body of the snake, the more difficult it is. But early in the spring, you walk around any of the lakes, you'll see water snakes just hanging over the water and, and branches, sometimes pretty high up off the ground. When people ask me what I feed my snakes, they're like, well, you just feed them bugs and worms and stuff. No, in fact, no, people are so sweet and so nice. They find a snake and they're like, just get this out of my yard. I don't want it, I don't want to kill it, but I want it gone. And so they'll give it to me and they'll say, I gave it some crickets, but it's not eating it because it doesn't eat crickets. There are some snakes, however, that do eat insects. Uh, some you may have never seen and may never see in this state. There's a smooth green snake, which blends in quite nicely with grass. A lion snake, um, a worm snake and a ringneck snake. Oddly enough, these the names of these four, it's like nobody had any imagination to name these snakes. <laughs> the smooth green snake, the snake with the line on it. Oh, let's call it a lion snake. Well, that snake looks like a worm. Let's call it a worm snake. <clears throat> and that snake's got a ring around its neck. Let's just call that a ringneck snake. There's got to be a better name for any of these things. And frogs and toads. For any snakes that eat frogs and toads, because they're gross. Yes, there are some snakes that only eat frogs and toads. Hognose snakes, for example, the eastern hognose snake, you can't convince it to eat a mouse or to eat anything else but a frog or a toad. Um, on the bottom left there is one we came across in the middle of the road, struggling to get a toad in its mouth. That toad was probably weighed a good 10 to 15 grams more than that snake but he got it down. So hognose snakes, the same hognose snake that eats the turtle eggs also eats toads. Do they have something that they inject when they see them down and it's biting them? They, you mean the toads? The snakes? So what they do, they use the little shovel noses, their hog noses mm -hmm. to kind of sift sand out of the way and bury themselves. They find toads and they grab them and pop them. They have two fangs on the back of their mouths. And they know the first thing a toad does when, it, when, you, when you pick it up, well, the second thing, the first thing it does is pees on it. What's the second thing it does, right? And that's its defense, is to puff up and make it difficult to swallow. These guys are like, <laughs> watch this. And they bite in like they're popping a balloon and then they're able to swallow it without a problem. You can see that one is still got a, a little puffiness to them. But that's what those fangs generally do. They do have a mild venom, but the venom isn't necessarily for killing toads. It doesn't kill toads. Um, it would hurt if you stuck your finger in a hognose snake's mouth all the way down and then pulled back really hard, you might get a little local reaction. But that's it. Not gonna, nobody's that ever died or had any serious reaction to a hognose venom. Was that toad alive? Yes, the toad is still alive. So the toad was alive until the legs finally went down. And then you can still see it kicking and it wasn't going to make it. So the white, the gray kind of in the middle of the toad and the green on the side is the mouth of the snake? Yes. So this is the bottom of the mouth and the top of the mouth is on the empty side of the toad. Oh. We have a whole series of photos as it swallows us. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at them really fast, it looks like a motion picture. <laughs> It was, it was a fun day. Okay. Um, uh oh, until we found another one in my stack. <laughs> it took about an hour for to get that turned out. Yeah, a little bit of time. Um, the, and we can talk later about large food items and why snakes eat large food items, but they tend to eat things that are way bigger than their heads. And, they have an adaptation in their quadrate bones that allows them to do this. They don't dislocate their bones so much, but they've got very loose ligaments that allow them to kind of separate their jaws and still remain attached, but to make their mouths open a little bit more. There's a reason they eat big food. What about fish? Yeah. 
how many people have went fishing and had a snake bite your fish or your bait as you reel it back in. It's pretty common. I have some water snakes in the lab at work that take tilapia out of my hands. I cut them up in little pieces, I hold them there and they come up and they're like, and they eat the fish. Yeah, they can eat fish. Uh, there are some that eat fish regularly, like the water snakes, the diamondback water snake, and the common water snake. But garter snakes will eat a fish from time to time. Um, if you have a garter snake that you want to keep as a pet and it's not eating mice, because they generally don't, get them some goldfish. They'll eat goldfish, they'll eat minnows. Eventually, they'll eat tilapia. And then there's some snakes that are just simply food snobs. They will only eat one thing, crayfish snakes. What do you think they eat? Crayfish, crawdads. You guys are such southerners. <laughs> crawdads. At least they didn't call them mud bugs. Uh, these two middle snakes here, the decays brown snake and the red bellied snake, are specialized for eating snails. They can actually, like in this photograph, put their heads inside the opening of a snail and then use their bottom, use their mandible, which comes out a little bit farther than their, their, their maxillary, and suck them out. Wow. Pull out snails. They eat slugs too. Why? Yeah, uh, the snake on the bottom is a snake that's found in the western part of the state, the southwest particularly, and it's a centipede eater. It eats little centipedes. Again, why? Who knows? And of course, there are the snakes that eat other snakes. Uh, in Nebraska, king snakes, racers, and coach whips are all famous snake eaters. Uh, the picture on the bottom is a speckled king snake eating what's left of a copperhead. Uh, so they even eat venomous snakes. They have an immunity to the venom, the racers as well. Racers will eat rattlesnakes. Coach whips will eat rattlesnakes. Coach whips will eat turtles. They're garbage disposal. They'll eat almost anything. Yeah. Southwest. So from the Kansas Colorado border. East to about Red Willow County. Nick, 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 what's that town? Nick. <laughs> Look up. <laughs> yes. Look up. If my friends are watching, they're laughing at me because that's my process. <laughs> I'll go through like seven letters and then I'll finally pick the right one. It's not the right letter I started with. Yeah. Yeah. Third largest snake in Nebraska, because that's coming up here pretty short. What's Nebraska's largest snake and the smallest snakes? But yeah. 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 Oddly enough, you can see coach whips from Florida all the way to California, and they're just one species. Now, if you're a splitter, then there are several subspecies. If you're a lumper, then it's just one species with a lot of different colors. There are other kinds of closely related snakes, whip snakes, but the coach whip itself, the eastern and western coach whips, the two different subspecies, and uh, they have different colors. In the east, they're almost jet black with a little bit of tan on their tail. And in the west, the farther west you go, they become almost reddish pink, right? So this is one from Nebraska. It's got a little bit of pink in it, but it's mostly tan. Pretty boring. Red. Yeah, Texas, Arizona, California, New Mexico, they get a little redder. I mean, they're variable, but there's a lot more red ones down there. <laughs> Funny you should ask that. <laughs> they will, <laughs> so they will grab a snake at mid-body. It's, it's like, if you try to wait, it's like when you try to catch a snake, you're like, you try to grab it at the head, it's gone by that point. Mm -hmm. So they will grab it at mid-body, and then they will slowly chew their way to the head, and then start swallowing mm -hmm. it head first. Snake's still alive all this time. I know, but it's pretty cool to watch. It is. I'll get video someday. <laughs> Next time. Another trick question. Are there any poisonous snakes in Nebraska? Venomous snakes. Right. So this is where I become a little bit of a jerk. <laughs> no, there are no poisonous snakes in Nebraska. Poison and venom are a couple of different things. Poison is something that you ingest. I saw a whole wall full of poisonous mushrooms. Mushrooms can be poisonous. Um, Toxins like arsenic and strychnine can be poisonous, but venom has to be injected. There's gotta be some kind of a mechanism to get it into your blood. With snakes, it's fangs, right? Some kind of a delivery mechanism. With bees and with wasps, it's a stinger. With catfish, it's their dorsal fin. With lionfish, it's their dorsal fin. So there's lots of different venomous animals, but 
um, you have to get the venom inside your blood somehow. Some are both, like a porcupine fish, right? They're both venomous and poisonous. Don't eat one. So they said, they, I can't remember the name of the toxins, but. So that being said, yes, Nebraska has four venomous snake species, maybe. There we go. Uh, in the West, the Western third to half of the state is full of prairie rattlesnakes in different places. There's some places where you can't see one, but there are lots of other places where they're relatively abundant. Scott's Bluff is one of the best places to see one, right? Take a nice walk on Scott's Bluff trails during May, and if you don't see one, then you're not paying attention. And they're pretty common in, up in Iowa. <laughs> yeah. uh, in the Southeast, the timber rattlesnake, the massasauga rattlesnake, and the copperhead are three venomous snakes that only occur in the extreme southeast corner of Nebraska. Note, none of them is a water moccasin, right? I don't even want to tell you how many times I've been kicked off of Nebraska through the lens for arguing with people. <laughs> they have said they found it, but I found a water moccasin. The guy from UNL told me it was a water moccasin, but it's not. And I'm like, bring it to me. I don't have to prove anything to you. So. If you're sure that there are water moccasins in Nebraska and you want to prove it to me, bring me one. Even bring me a live one. I will let it bite me and not die. If you found a snake in Nebraska that you think is a water moccasin, as long as it's not one of those four snakes, I'll let it bite me. And when I don't die, hopefully you'll be convinced. A lot of people in the lab think there's some water moccasins in the big water snakes. But why do they think they're water moccasins? Because they swim. Oh. Because they like to sensationalize, you know. Everybody likes to say they found something they didn't find. Everybody catches a fish like this, but it's two feet long. Everybody does that. Don't they? So if it's not a water moccasin, then how do you know? Good question. A couple of different ways. I mean, if you really want to get down on the ground and look at the water moccasin or the snake to see if it has a pit, a pit viper does. Sure, go right ahead. If you want to look at the ventral scales to see that they're clean and there's no pattern, be my guest. But if you see them in the water and you see a snake that's swimming in the water with most of its body on top of the water and its head up, that's a cottonmouth, right? Cottonmouths and other vipers are able to swim with their heads up above the water and they can strike you while you're in the water. Water snakes, they sink. When they stop swimming, their head stays above water and then they're like, oh, the rest of their body just sinks. When they're swimming, some of their body comes above the water. And people will tell me, yeah, I've seen their bodies come above water. Like, not when they stop. This is what they look like when they stop. They take a break, their body sinks down in, and they also cannot raise their head while they're in the water and bite you. Again, you don't want to test that, but if you want to. So is that cottonmouth? Not, that's not in the No, cottonmouth is the official name. Oh, right? Because because my friends will yell at me if I call it a moccasin. It's not, I mean, moccasin is a, is a common name for them in other places in the world. But cottonmouth is their official common name. My nerdy friends are making fun of me now, I can tell. The closest one is in Southwest Missouri or Oklahoma. Some places in Oklahoma you can find one. Would you like one? No, thank you. Oh, come on. They're very good pets. <laughs> they respond, they're very smart. All right, well, if you change mine, let me know. Uh, they'll eat anything. Yeah, they'll catch fish and they'll eat fish, but they'll also eat mammals and they'll also eat roadkill. Like <laughs> they, they die on roads because they're sitting there trying to peel up something that's dead on the road and a car just runs them over. And not the only snakes that do this. I've seen, I have photos of a garter snake peeling up a dead frog that had rocks all in it. And it's like sitting there all proud of itself. It's like, ah, 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 ah. he's eating this frog with, with the rocks in it. So, dumb. garter snakes are dumb, but all right, well, let's take a snake break for a little bit. What do you call a lizard with no legs? A snake, right? That's what everybody says, a snake. Yeah. You call it a legless lizard, of course, because that's what it is. Uh, we have one legless lizard in Nebraska. It's called a slender glass lizard. Um, it's called a glass lizard because if you grab it by the tail, it will just guard its tail, maybe in two or three pieces, like you pick something up glass and it just shattered in your hands. It'll grow back. Like you can see in the bottom there, somebody picked that up and 
and show, shows off the tail. Hmm. But you know they're not snakes for two reasons. One, they can close their eyes, right? When I do this with kids, I'm like, okay, everybody close your eyes. And they're all afraid because they usually have a snake now. Close yeah. your eyes. <laughs> I'm like, you're all doing something that a snake can't do. And then I'll say, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Can you all hear me? Now you're doing something, another, another thing that snakes can't do. They can't hear any, no ears, they have no eyelids. These lizards have eyelids, upper and lower eyelids, and they have a little ear hole that leads to an inner ear. Something that the snakes don't have. But you didn't know this. Lizards cannot breathe while they're running. They can't. It's sad. Yeah, because they'd be such great marathon runners. There's a lizard in Nebraska called the race runner. You would think it could marathon its way out of anything. So it runs pretty fast because it's out. It likes hot weather. It's out when it's 105 degrees outside. It's out rolling around. But you can watch it run and then it'll stop. And then it'll run again, hold its breath, and then stop. And it cannot run long distances for long periods of time, kind of like a cheetah. A cheetah can still run a little bit, though, but these guys run out of breath. And there are three lizards, well, four technically, but these three lizards here in Nebraska um, are all runaway lizards if you chase them, and they all have the same problem. They have to stop and catch their breath. So they try to find hiding spots. Like they'll hide under a yucca or in a hole or something like that. And to show that they run fast and as an adaptation to fast running, they all have really long toes on their hind legs. And those toes help them move around in sand without digging little holes and trying to run away. Turtle trivia. Where do turtles keep their ribs? In the refrigerator with the other leftover Chinese food? Spare ribs. Turtles ribs are fused to their shell. Right, so you can see in this skeleton of a turtle, and you have a couple of carapaces over there. If there's still some skeleton left in it, you can see that the ribs are fused to the top shell. Um, but this makes breathing a problem. If you inhale, you can see that your rib muscles will pull your ribs out so that you can let more air into your thoracic cavity. And when you exhale, then it pulls them back in, right? It relaxes them. These guys can't do that because they don't have a diaphragm, first of all, and they don't have ribs that can change their shape. So instead, to breathe, they have to move. It's the exact opposite of a stupid lizard. Lizards can't breathe while they're moving. These guys breathe while they're moving. When they move, their head and their front limbs work like a, a diaphragm. So they kind of trap air and cause air pressure to change inside so that their lungs will expand and contract. Did you know that before we came in here? Sweet. We're learning <laughs> stuff. We're learning stuff. All right. You probably knew that turtles don't have teeth, right? They have beaks instead. You ever been bit by a turtle? No. no? I got a snapper bite right here. Oh. Stupidity. I was out putting microchips in turtles and I was holding it like this and somebody was putting a microchip in the leg and the head was like, Poink! Made that sound like a cartoon. You know, when a cartoon bites something, it makes that doink sound. Yeah. Yep. You can only see it when I get a tan. How did you get a tan? I just dropped it. <laughs> and like, nope, I'm not having that. Yeah, so they have a beak. They're the only reptiles, other than birds, that don't have teeth. Right? So birds don't have teeth either. And they also have, it's, it's the same material. It's keratin, the same material your fingernails are made out of, and rhino horn, and all that stuff. Uh, also, not all turtles have hard shells. And Nebraska has two species of soft shell turtles. Mm -hmm. I've heard them called leatherbacks, uh, but they're soft shells. We don't have a leatherback as a big sea turtle. I wish we had them here, but we don't. All right, so two kinds of soft shell turtles. The turtle lives on land, doesn't go in the water. Does that mean it's a tortoise? No. So now, what's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Well, you don't want to answer that one, do you? <laughs> Nobody does. Anybody? What's the difference? That's true. But what about a box turtle? Box turtles don't go in the water. You know, usually. 
you know, in the water. When it rains heavy, they'll go in the water and drink, but they don't swim. So if you saw a box turtle and a tortoise running side by side, how would you know which one is the tortoise and which one is the turtle? Well, if you look at a turtle in the box turtle, right? You ever walk the sand hills and you rescue them off the road, you can look and watch them walk away and they walk like this. Their toes are spread out and their foot is on the ground. The tortoise walks like that on its tippy toes. That's the big difference. One of the other differences is that tortoises are like 100% or herbaceous, like they, all they do is eat plant material. But plants, there's some turtles that also eat some plant material. So you can't use that as the deciding factor. But it's the feet. It's all in the feet. And a picture, right? See the turtle? Got his claws out. He's got his feet on the ground. And you see the tortoise. He's walking around his tiptoes. And uh, two different modes of walking. By the way, your new box turtle is now our official state reptile. Did I see somebody out there with a license plate? Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I, I saw was trying to think which car we have. You've got the <laughs> one, I've got the box turtle. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I can't have one yet because I have a personalized plate. It says Vipers, but it's the Wumpers. Like I had to get the one instead of the eye because some yeah. goofball has got the eye for his Dodge Viper or whatever. <laughs> um, so, it's too many letters to put on one of the animal plates. And I have to give that up. I don't want to give that up yet. When I retire from vipers, I'll do that. Or when they start putting. Uh, it's already got one. It's like, <laughs> right? I'm already lacking a vowel. I don't want to take the other vowel away. Uh, I don't know. I bet somebody already has that too. I guarantee it, somebody does. What else we got? All right, turtles spend all winter under the water. This is how they hibernate. How do they breathe underwater? And they do. They'll go in the water, they'll dive down sometime around now, and you won't see them again until March. Right now on a nice warm day, if there's no ice on the surface, they'll come up and bask. Then they go right back down and go back to sleep. How do they breathe under the water? Big little oxygen tank. Right? Little scuba tanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, they like everybody else breathes underwater. They breathe through their butts. <laughs> <laughs> Turtles have an organ called a cloacal bursa. And now they don't breathe through their butts. The cloacal bursa is attached to their butts, but water is brought in, sucked in through their butts, and then the bursa will take the oxygen out of the water and use that for gas exchange for what little metabolism they have while it's that cold and they're under the water. So it's a little diagram of what a cloacal bursa, what two cloacal bursae look like and where the cloaca is. Cloaca is like a common dumping ground, right? Anything that comes out of a reptile, including birds, right? Eggs, whatever, all comes out from the same hole. Pee, poop, eggs, sex organs. They all come out from the same hole, uh, the, the cloaca. False map turtle, painted turtle, a couple of other Nebraska butt breathers. Um, all the turtles in Nebraska are able to do this. All turtles that are aquatic are generally able to do this. Now, who's the biggest snake in Nebraska? Rat snake. All right, the rat snake? Well, so here's another question. What's the largest snake in the world? Python, reticulated python? Bigger than, is it larger than an anaconda? So here's where you got to split hairs, right? Large means length and girth, like big old snake. And length goes to the python. Like the python is the longest snake in the world, but the anaconda wins hands down as the largest snake in the world. You know, 25 to 30 feet long, 450 pounds. That's, that's huge. The reticulated python can get to about 25 to 30 feet long as well and regularly gets to that size, but it's like half the weight. It's a much more slender snake. In fact, we're able to climb trees at 25 feet long, which is amazing to me. But in Nebraska, and this is a fight that we like to have amongst ourselves, uh, the largest snake is the bull snake, the largest known snake. In terms of girth, in terms of length, in terms of weight, is the bull snake. Right Now, they don't get to seven or eight feet anymore. But there are reports from, uh, from natural history surveys back in the 1800s where snakes were caught that were eight feet long. Why not they get so big? People kill them. Same thing with diamondbacks down in Florida. 
the Diamondbacks in Florida used to easily exceed eight feet. Now you have you can have a plant a five footer. They just the larger they get, the more conspicuous they are, and the more they get killed. We do have two other contenders, like second and third place, the Western rat snake or the black rat snake, the one that can climb trees and eat birds and babies, and eggs and stuff. Uh, can easily get up to seven. We found them seven feet long, but they, because they climb, they're a little bit thinner. You know, they don't have that same that same weight that the bull snake has. Uh, similar attitude. <laughs> and then the coach whip, we've seen coach whips that were between six and seven feet, uh, much more slender snake than either of these two. Uh, they're a type of whip snake, so they move pretty quickly through the grass. And so they maintain their, their lovely slim figure, but they're still get, they still get pretty long, large. Now the smallest snake in Nebraska. Again, we're gonna see some snakes you probably never heard of. Maybe you've heard of them. Some of them you have here. At least one of them I know you have here on this property, right? So there are lots of really, 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 really small snakes that are in contention for smallest snake, but these are the five, these five all fit on a coin. So we're gonna call it a five way tie. The top is the Western worm snake. We've already seen this guy earlier, but here's one of the, this is a brand new baby uh, uh, with a penny. The red bellied snake is sitting on a dollar coin. The DK's brown snake is sitting on a nickel. The ring neck snake on a dime and then the black headed snake on a coin. Right? So, <laughs> I tried to keep them close to the relative size, except for the dollar. The dollar's a little bit big, so. That's all I had in my pocket. You can't even find one of those dollar coins. That's an Eisenhower dollar. You don't see those anymore. Yeah, I was a numismatist nerd when I was a kid, too. But yeah, Eisenhower dollars. So we have five-way tie. Uh, some of these get very, very small as babies. It's hard to even see them. But when you do, you're amazed that they even live when they're that small. Oh, the brown snake, the one, the one on the bottom right. Let me just go back here. Decay's brown snake. They're pretty abundant in even most backyards around here. You can find them. Yeah. Yeah. So sometime around uh, August, I'll say October. Sometime around August, the females will give birth. And people, this is how I get a lot of these pictures too. Uh, people will bring snakes to me and say, yeah, I found this in my yard and I don't really want it here. And it's a big pregnant female. And she'll dump out 20 babies and they'll be like that long. Tiny little things. You can't even use them for bait. They're so small. And it's live. They're live birds. They're live birds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, really two, two of these, the red bellied and decays brown snake are live birds. The other three come from eggs. The western worm snake is weird and only usually only lays about two eggs at a time. The ring neck snake is odd because the females will communally nest. Like all the females will put all their eggs in one basket. Literally. They'll just find a place and dump all their eggs and they don't stay with them. But um, yeah, hope for the rest. But they all, like you, you, when you find babies, you usually find lots of them in one place. The eggs all hatch at one time or close to one time. I really don't know enough about plains black headed snake babies. I know the literature says two to three eggs at a time, so not a lot. This hurts my ears, <laughs> right? Yeah, I've got gardener snakes in my yard. Really? The gardener snake, what? So you got a snake in your yard that can pick up a hoe and a rake and it can grow stuff and plant stuff and sow <laughs> stuff. You don't have a gardener snake. There's no gardener snake. No such thing as a gardener snake. However, we have four species of garter snakes in the state, four different, complete different species, and they're pretty cool. The red-sided garter, the common garter snake on the top, I would say is hands down one of our prettiest snakes, right? Some of these things get so red, like that one. I had no choice but to photograph. <laughs> um, but even the ribbon snake, it says ribbon snake and its name, but it's still a type of garter snake, the same genus as the other three garter snakes. And they're named after a garter, like the thing that brides wear on their legs. And, Oh, and throw into the crowd for the next person to not pick up so they don't have to get married, <laughs> right? That's where the name comes from. Some more lies. Uh, there are two of them, the Plains Garter Snake and the Common or the Red Sided Garter Snake that are statewide. The Ribbon Snake is restricted to the Southeast, like uh, along the Missouri River, Nemaha River, and that's pretty much about it. 
and they may get as far north as Cass County as plasma give or take. Um, the west of the terrestrial garden snake only found in the Panhandle, only found now, only known from two counties, Banner County and Sioux County. It probably exists in Shadron State Park that nobody's found one. So you want to make me very happy with that one. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting ready to update the state field guide. So I'm going to spend a couple of years wandering around trying to pick up new records and make the book a little bit more accurate. You mean that back in the first time? Eleven years ago? Yeah. <laughs> it's due for an update. <laughs> well, good. I'm going to make you throw it away and get a new one. <laughs> I will. I will. Well, the university published it and they gave me 55 free copies last time. And uh, they that lasted like uh, two weeks. But I'll be, a, I'll be a little more selective this time because some of those people I gave me speaks to are jerks now. And I don't like them. <laughs> Wouldn't get them. All right. More lies. You ever heard this story? Milk snakes. No, I hear it in Kansas. That's how they get the name, right? There are people who I've literally talked to who said, yeah, I got these, these milk snakes out there and I kill them because they drink my cow's milk. No. They don't even have the fringial muscles for that. Yeah, so no. What? Yeah. So the first ones that were discovered were discovered in a pasture. And of course, imagination is run wild. You got a snake out in your pasture. There's lots of them in the pasture because they're under the rocks in the pasture. And then all of a sudden, well, they must be up. What are they eating? They're small. They got to be eating milk. So they're sucking the milk off the teats and cows. Um, it's a pretty far fetched story. And how it got to keep the name is beyond me. Milk snakes are a type of king snake. Like they're the same genus as those speckled king snakes and the California king snakes, and those snakes that eat other snakes. And these guys will eat other snakes, but they're predominantly lizard eaters and small rodent eaters. But if you put two milk snakes of the differing sizes together, you will have one big one. They will cannibalize each other. Some other lies. Only snakes with elliptical pupils are venomous. Elliptical, right? The slit cat eyes. Have you heard that? <laughs> That's what I tell people. I'm like, how the hell do you Well, I'll kill you. And it's not true. Well, I will say that here in Nebraska, it is true, right? So I will give you a buy if it's in Nebraska. But elsewhere, look at the snakes that are not elliptically pupiled coral snakes, cobras, mambas, fierce snakes from Australia. These are all some of the deadliest snakes in the world, and they have round pupils. I would rather come in contact with a rattlesnake's fangs than with the cobra's fangs any day. Preferably neither, but whatever. All right, getting close to the end here. It is the Blanding's turtle. This is the smiliest turtle in the state. Look at that. They never stop smiling. <laughs> you could kick them across the street and they'd be like, do it again. <laughs> They're just always so happy. They love their, they love their life. <laughs> Blanding's turtles. Oddly enough, the Blanding's turtles in Nebraska, we have more Blanding's turtles in Nebraska than all other states that have them combined. Every state in the Union and in Canada and Nova Scotia and the other places in Canada where it exists, it is disappearing and in most cases pretty close to extinct, right? We find more dead ones on the road than probably the whole state of Massachusetts has altogether. We have that many in Nebraska that we can afford to lose 20 or 30 every couple of weeks on the roads from Thedford to Valentine because they're crossing the roads to go lay eggs or to go find boyfriends or girlfriends. So we have hundreds of thousands of them in Nebraska. And no offense if you voted for the box turtle as the stupid state reptile, it should have been this. This should have been nominated. It wasn't even nominated as the state reptile, but that was a game of parks thing, not a Dan Fogel thing. But anyway, this is what puts Nebraska on the map herpetologically. If anybody wants to come, if there are, any, if there are people who are looking to check things off their life lists, this is what they come to see. And you can see these pretty regularly in the sand hills, in some of the, the sand hills lakes south of Meyerbeer or south of Valentine. Much more habitat. They're, so the, where they exist in the east, like Ohio, Michigan, et cetera, is bog habitat, marsh habitat. 
which just happens to be the same kind of habitat people like to build buildings on, right? You know, or houses or neighborhoods yeah. or whatever. But here, they're in the sand hills by the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. The sand hills are not a place where you want to put a city like a bank, a big giant bank and a big giant supermarket or whatever. Right. And, yeah. and it's, and it, yeah, for a lot of reasons, not besides the fact that it's an eyesore. Uh, it's just not the right kind of ground to build those kind of buildings. On. And so they get left alone. They, they pretty much get to establish themselves. What, the number one killer of landing turtles, what do you think? Yeah. Nope. Raccoons. Raccoons. Raccoons eat their eggs. Oh. Raccoons have a field day. When they run around and they dig up these turtle eggs, they don't care what kind of turtle it is. They just sit there and eat the eggs like it's a like it's a buffet, mm -hmm. right? Or if there's multiple species like a smorgasbord. They just kill and eat the eggs and then they're done, they move on. So every year, these turtles are losing more and more recruitment. Babies are not hatching, babies not entering the population. And so their numbers are steady, but eventually you're gonna see them start to decline because we're not gonna get any babies that are gonna make it to that adult age. You know how old they have to be to reproduce? Males are 12, females are 18. Ooh. Females have to be 18 years old. A turtle has to survive 18 years before she can even start to have babies, to start, start to lay eggs, right? Like humans are having kids earlier than that. And they live to 70 or 80 years old. So they can have lots of babies over their lifetime, but they still need a few to survive to adulthood. Anyway. Oh, I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, stop, stop subsidizing the, 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 the saving of raccoons. You know, if you find a raccoon, don't bring it someplace and let them milk it back to life and let it go someplace else, just euthanize it. There are too many raccoons. I know raccoons are cute. I love raccoons. I've had them around me all the time. They're, they're great pets sometimes, they're a little mischievous, but you know, from a wild standpoint, they are extremely destructive, very destructive and they're everywhere. There's no place in this country you cannot find a raccoon. In the middle of the sand hills where you're like, how, how, do they, how do they survive out here? Well, they survive on turtle eggs. Mm -hmm. Among other things, crayfishes and other kinds of things. Oh, how big is a mature? A mature? So the females are, and males have different sizes, but a mature one will be about 14, 15 inches, right? When, it, when it's fully like 25, 30 years old. Um, I found one, so this one is a youngster. Uh, you can actually tell how old a turtle is, estimate anyway, by counting the rings, just like at a tree, right? So look at the rings here. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is a seven-year-old turtle. It was like this big. Oh, that was that big? Yeah, it's small. Right? I had another one that was hit by a car. I don't have a picture of it. It was hit by a car, had a cracked tail into the shell. So I glued the puzzle pieces back together, put some um, Bondo on it, nursed it back to health. Mm -hmm. And this thing was like this, mm -hmm. and she was only 11 or 12 years old. Mm -hmm. so they just, they just, they grow, they get big, and then they finally start to have babies at 18 or 20. So now that you've asked all the questions, mm -hmm. you don't have to have Q&A time, do really. we? You have any other questions that we didn't cover? Oh, oh. So, so Susan wants to go back to snapping turtles. Okay. <laughs> wants to know just how dangerous they can be. Oh. And she's found one that seriously needs a little trash can. So like she wants to know how dangerous it is to them if they pick it up or if they just leave it alone and let it walk away. How but, deadly the Nebraska snapping turtle is not deadly to them. It's not deadly to a human. Right. Well, you know, if it gets to certain organs, then it might be considered deadly, but it's not going to do that. Um, it's deadly to small animals, like it will eat your, your, your pond, your duck ponds, ducks, and your fishes, and things like that. But to humans, no. Uh, the, if it's bothering you, you can have somebody come and remove it for you, and they'll put it in. They live anywhere. You could pick a turtle up and let the snapping turtle up and let it go in the Missouri River, and you'll be fine. Right? It'll do quite well. But they're not deadly or harmful humans unless you want to pick them up. Just like mine, she would never touch it if it wasn't the dog or something. Oh, <laughs> just get the dog away from it. It won't kill the dog, but it will definitely pick up the or a tail. Right? 
Uh, yeah, the one in Shram, how old is that? 50, 60 years? It's enormous. Yeah, giant turtle. And it's, a, and it's a common snapping turtle, not an alligator snapper, which, which easily gets to 80 to 100 pounds. But this thing is enormous, and it's been in captivity for a long time, and it's been well fed, and it's probably a great baby. You know. <laughs> no, my niece, tilapia. <laughs> I buy the frozen tilapia, I them out. But, are the snappers the most turtle? Yes. Yeah. And they're, they also live a long time. They, um, a, a 50 pound snapping turtle, 40, 50 pound snapping turtle, is probably somewhere to, between 80 to 100 years old. Right? Uh, down in the southeast, the alligator snapping turtles, which are a much bigger turtle and much long lived turtle, have been found with Civil War bullets embedded in their shells. That's how old these things are. That's how long they've been for. And so the snapping turtles can live a long time. The reason that they're so angry, by the way, I, and I don't recommend this, especially for a giant turtle like that, but if you look at the underside, the plastron, most turtles have a nice big shell underneath them that protects them and control the body. They have a tiny little shell. The rest of it is all meat. It's why they're prized for meat turtle meat because you can get to their leg muscles right away. You don't have to carve through the shell to get to them. So they're very unprotected on the bottom part of their body, which makes them much more aggressive than anybody who wants to go after them. But it doesn't make them any less fun to play with. You know, a lot of but yeah, do not do not let a dog <laughs> play with a snapping turtle. Okay. There was one more. Someone just wants to know what native pigs make the best pets. Wow, so you're asking the wrong guy because I love garter snakes. I mean, I do. They make really good pets. They, they're personal. Like, they, they will get used to being fed and they will come out and wait for you to feed them. But they know that you're, when you walk in the room, they're like, I'm going to get some fish or I'm going to get whatever this is. And they start to bed. Now, that being said, they're dirty, they're smelly. Their poop stinks. When you pick them up, they will poop on you almost every time. They will eventually stop biting you. Um, but if you want to have a, like a pet Nebraska snake that is easy to feed, other than the garter snakes, uh, any of the, the small constrictors, so fox snakes, Great Plains rat snakes, uh, black rat snakes get a little big and they're a little aggressive. But if you get one as a youngster, they do pretty well. I have one here that you can play with. You don't bite the crap out of it. It's only, <laughs> it's only this big. So sometimes they're, they're mean as babies as well. Uh, bull snakes often do not calm down. They will consistently hiss and strike throughout their entire time in captivity. And people are like, eh, I just don't want it anymore. It's too mean. I can't hold it. It doesn't love me. <laughs> so. None of my friends said, get off the screen, you idiot. Like, cool. How's that? Good. I'll get that later. I probably have text building up like, oh my God, you look cool, like a moron. <laughs> so I do have, well, I have some questions for you guys, right? Did you learn something today that you didn't know yesterday? Because if you did, I did call it much more. Right? Hey, I want to minimize this. Yeah, my favorite cartoons. Oh, come on. What's that? Yeah, it was, but it's still, I should, oh, there it is, okay. Did you discover things that you believed all your life to be true that are in fact false? And again, I did my job. And lastly, and this is for you, if it ever pops up, did I say anything that makes you want to be a herpetologist? I mean, not that any of you aren't, young enough to still become a herpetologist, you still can, right? But this is something that the world needs in the future. Come on, we know you're in there. There we go. Yeah. So we recruit, right? I come across a lot of kids who like snakes. And they're like, yeah, I love snakes. I want to be a herpetologist and I want to get a ball python. I want to get this. I'm like, no, you want to be an enthusiast. You want to have pet snakes. You don't want to get out and get dirty and go chase snakes and radio track them and put microchips in them and regurgitate their body, their, their, their food to see what it is they're, eat, they're eating. Because that's the stuff that herpetology do. Doesn't that sound like fun? Yes, that does sound like fun. 
<laughs> right? Did you see the picture of the rattlesnake with the bird all puked up? I did that. <laughs> I was radio tracking it and I saw that it ate and I'm like, I gotta know what that is. So I grabbed it and I palpated whatever that food item was and it was a dick system. I said the picture of the game of parks. Yeah, yep. Yeah, one of the great herpetologists of my time, of our time, taught me how to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and then what he would do is he would force feed it back to the snake. I, I love snakes. I'll put them back in the bucket. And if it re-eats it, great. If it doesn't, nah, I'll give it a mouse before I let it go. Um, but it was a dick sizzle. You saw the picture of the dick sizzle. You guys remember it folks, right? So the dick sizzle came out of the rattlesnake, and the rattlesnake is a, is a threatened rattlesnake of the state. It has a threatened status. I sent the picture to the game of parks. I got back a very official email that said, we would appreciate it if your at-risk species would stop eating our at-risk species. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, all right, whatever. Anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed. I have some snakes for you to look at. Yeah. We were going to talk about why snakes eat big snakes. Okay, so no arms and legs, right? Okay, uh, they eat big things so that they're not vulnerable when they're constantly eating. When they eat something big, they're extremely vulnerable, right? And so they don't want to eat a lot. So they eat something big, so they're only vulnerable for a short period of time. They digest that, and that gives them the energy they need for a while, right? Now, if a bull snake ran around eating like little tiny shrews, we wouldn't need to eat a lot of them. Right? But if it eats one big rabbit, then it can hide someplace, digest that rabbit until that lump goes away, and then it's got tons of energy for the next two, three weeks, two, three months, maybe. With venomous snakes, it's a little, it's even a little better because what the venom does is it starts to digest the prey from the inside out. So as soon as a rattlesnake strikes a kangaroo rat, for example, I know they're cute, but they're the snickers bars of the sandhills. So as soon as the venom hits that that rat, it starts to digest the rat from the inside out. So now when the snake finds it, eats it, swallows it, the digestive process has already started and that lump is there even less time. So just adaptations to not having arms and legs and not being vulnerable. Well, you've got a big fat belly. I know I'm, I don't want to move after a meal. I'm like, nope, <laughs> not going anywhere. So I know how they feel. You mentioned a bit ago about, I'm sorry, it's, it's still Nope. When uh, a little bit ago you mentioned picking up snapping turtles, I thought I'd want to go out and try this. How do people pick up the snapping turtle? By the tail or by the back legs? Back legs is the best way. Tail is not the best way. Uh, the weight, the larger the turtle, picking up by the tail, the more the risk of dislocating vertebrae, right? Especially tail vertebrae, but even back vertebrae. So the weight of the turtle will actually pull on the vertebrae and separate, dislocate them. Um, but picking them up by the back legs, which is how I was holding that one, but mm -hmm. I would suggest picking the head in that way instead yes. of towards <laughs> right? You only do that once. You only make that mistake one time. And from now on, the head goes that way. Mm -hmm. um, another way, and with alligator snapping turtles, it's a little, I don't want to say easier, but there's really no chance that an alligator snapper's head is going to come up and bite you. But people grab them by the leading edge of the upper shell of the carapace and then pick them up that way. So they grab them right behind where the head is because their head can't get around to bite you while you're holding them there. And then pick up the posterior edge and just pick them up like that. And that's probably the better way to pick up an extremely large one, mm -hmm. a 40, 50 pound. And so if they want to move the turtles up a little like that, that's how I would suggest doing it. Right. Well, Nobody's going to do it. No. <laughs> I watched a friend of mine, hopefully he's watching, I watched him try to do this one time. And it, it takes nerve to, yes. to realize. So like, it's like, I, I know it's not going to kill me. I know it's not going to bite me if I do it this way, but it still looks like it's going to. And the turtle is this the whole time. It's striking the whole time. It's working its head around and it's trying to get you. Um, soft shell turtles, on the other hand, which can get big, right? They can get pretty good size. <laughs> their heads are long enough to come around and get you. Right? So you can hold them like that and their heads are going to come out and, and bite you. So you've got to hold those by their back legs or by their trail edge, the trailing edge of the carapace. And hold them up like that. But yeah, you should do it. Okay, I'll take you out. I know a place where you can find extremely large snapping turtles and we just go play with them. Yeah. 
Well, he can pick one up. No, no, no. I photograph people <laughs> picking them up. I don't do that. <laughs> right. I'm alive to tell them. <laughs> Living. Well, I think that's all we got. So, any more questions?